Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hunter Montgomery. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Higher Logic. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar session, The Effortless Experience, with our guest host, Matt Dixon. Matt is a group leader of the financial services and customer contact practices of CEB in Arlington, Virginia. In this capacity has an executive management responsibility for CEB's businesses in the areas of customer service, customer experience, retail banking, commercial banking, wealth management, and back office financial services operations. Matt also leads the new product development team for CEB's large business unit. In addition to his management responsibility at CEB, Matt is a noted business writer. His first book, The Challenger Sale, Taking Control of the Customer Conversation, was a number one Amazon and Wall Street Journal bestseller and has sold more than half a million copies worldwide. His two most recent books are The Effortless Experience, Conquering the New Battleground for Customer Loyalty, and The Challenger Customer, Selling to Hidden Influencer Who Can Multiply Your Results. Prior to his current role, Matt had managed responsibilities for CEB's sales practice and held management and leadership roles in CEB's new product development function. We at HireLogic are excited to have Matt with us today. Please feel free to use the chat box to post your questions. We'll try to address them at the end of the webinar session. Matt, take it away. Thanks very much, Hunter, and uh, thanks um, uh, to the HireLogic team for inviting me today. It's a great opportunity. Um, I am going to, let me see if I can get us to screen share here. I'm going to rely on the, um, the higher logic team to let me know if uh, screen sharing is failing us. Uh, so guys, please interrupt me if um, uh, the slides are not tracking, but I'm going to assume here we're okay. Um, here's how I'd like to spend the time, um, I think with uh, Hunter set up. Um, I would like to spend probably the next uh, 50 to 55 minutes uh, going through just a Cliff Notes version of our work around the effortless experience um, and uh, kind of give everyone a bit of a, a primer on that research. Uh, walk through it. It's going to be I feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, and I will also forewarn you that um, I, I will sometimes go a little bit long, and so I, this might run right up to the top of the hour, in which case I will apologize now. I will definitely let you go on time, but if we don't get to your questions, um, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter or by LinkedIn. Uh, I'd be more than happy to connect with you um, uh, there and answer your questions uh, on a one-off basis. So uh, just because we may not get to them today, by all means, um, feel free to reach out and connect and ask me any questions you might have uh, after the session today. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's get into it. I, this is a research um, that's really around this idea of um, how we deliver a low effort customer experience. But let me kind of back up a little bit and start with a, a bit of a story here. I think it's a nice way to start, you know, really kind of help people understand um, what an effort, not just what an effortless experience is, but also what it's not. Um, if you're looking at the same slide I'm looking at right now, you're looking at a picture of a giraffe, a stuffed giraffe, or it used to be a giraffe, I think, until it was heavily loved by its owner. Um, this, uh, this toy, this stuffed animal, uh, is named Joshi the Giraffe. This was a, um, a toy uh, belonging to, a stuffed animal belonging to a little boy named Timmy Hurd. Uh, Timmy and the Hurd family are residents of Orlando, Florida. And a number of years ago, the Hurd family was on a, uh, a family trip. They went on an extended uh, weekend trip to the Ritz-Carlton at Amelia Island in Florida, which is a really beautiful uh, property. Um, on the way back from the trip, uh, after they... You know, they stayed late the last day. They, they drove home in wet bathing suits. They made the long drive back to Orlando to their home because the kids had school the next day. As they were getting the kids kind of um, uh, into their – tucked into bed, uh, Timmy bolted upright as his dad was tucking in and had a galactic DEFCON 1 Stage 5 meltdown uh, because he realized that his best friend in the world, uh, Joshua the Giraffe, was nowhere to be found. He wasn't with him. He had gone missing. Um, so uh, his dad, in, in an attempt to get uh, Timmy to stop crying and uh, stop having a meltdown, uh, said, and I, I'm a little bit surprised still to this day that he told his son this, he said, uh, Timmy, you're misunderstanding the whole situation here. Um, Joshie's not missing. We actually told him that he could spend a couple of extra days at the Rich Carlton getting a little bit of Joshie time, you know, so a little bit of R&R for himself. Um, Timmy, uh, surprisingly, he is five years old, but surprisingly believed this whopper of a lie, sort of sniffled himself to sleep, and as soon as he did so, mom and dad sort of flew into a whirlwind of activity trying to retrace their steps, take, you know, all the seats out of the minivan to try to see if Joshie had somehow gotten stuffed under, behind one of the seats, uh, tearing the bags apart, the whole nine yards. Um, and the last thing they did before they threw in the towel in sort of exhaustion and desperation, it's very late at night at this point, 
uh, Timmy's dad noticed that his phone, which had been on silent, had a voicemail on it. Uh, he listened to his uh, voicemail, and it turns out there was a call from the hotel manager at the Ritz-Carlton at Amelia Island. Uh, um, and the message said something to the effect of, Mr. Hurd, I, I think this is your number. This is the number we have on file for you. Um, I want to let you know that I think you left a member of your party behind, and he sort of then started to describe Joshi the giraffe. Said, "Looks like it's a stuffed animal. Not 100% sure what kind of animal it is, but it looks like a child's toy. I'm sure whoever lost it in your family would love it back. So, if it's yours, give me a call. Here's my mobile phone number. Call me anytime and just verify that's yours, and we'll get it back to you." So obviously, Timmy's dad is thrilled. Uh, he calls the hotel manager. He actually gets him at home because it's so late at night. Um, the hotel manager uh, answers the phone, he, and he asks him a couple questions. He verifies that Josh is, in fact, um, a member of the Herd family. And his, his, Timmy's dad says in his excitement, he says, you know, uh, can you believe it that I actually told my son that uh, Joshy was spending a few more days at the Ritz Carlton at your hotel, uh, getting a little bit of Joshy time. And now that you're sending him back, you have absolutely rescued us. Um, and you helped me not to be seen as a liar for the rest of my son's natural life. So thank you for that. Um, but here's the moment, I think, if for all of us who are in the world of customer experience, um, customer service, um, can really appreciate. If we think about what would we have done if we were running that, um, that service organization, Rich Colton, what would we have done in that moment? And what most people say is, well, I would have gotten the Hurd uh, family's address and sent Joshi back, and maybe I would have sent Joshi overnight because it belongs to a uh, a little boy who's very upset that his best friend in the world's gone missing. But here's the moment where the Ritz Carlton didn't just go for the um, for hitting the customer's expectations; they went for exceeding the customer's expectations. So um, the hotel manager told his staff to take Joshi around the hotel property the next morning and to pose him in a variety of locations uh, around the hotel. So there you see Joshi lounging, lounging poolside on the upper left, uh, getting a massage on the upper right. Um, that's like a $400 massage, by the way, at the Ritz-Carlton. Um, on the lower left, making some new friends, and on the lower right, playing around with golf. Um, as one uh, executive who I presented this to said once, you know, this stuffed animal had a better vacation than he had uh, last year. And I think this is probably true for most of us uh, listening to today's webinar. But um, what the hotel manager did is he got all these pictures taken. He put them all in a photo album, um, put Joshi, the photo album, and then a whole bunch of gifts for the kids, like Frisbees and some bathrobes and beach towels from the Ritz Carlton, put it in a box, sent it overnight to the Hurd family. They got it the next day, and they opened up, and they were absolutely overjoyed. Now, the reason I'm telling you the story is not because it's a feel-good story, but actually what I'm going to tell you in a little bit is um, it might not be the best strategy for driving customer loyalty. Though I'll tell you how I heard about this story as a researcher. Um, I got started getting um, emails from executives, uh, clients that I work with, heads of customer experience and customer service from big companies around the world, who forwarded me about a blog post, which was written by, actually, Timmy's dad, which told the story of Joshua the Giraffe and, and how wonderful it was to, be, to have his expectations thoroughly blown away by the Ritz Carlton. And he actually even says in this blog post something to the effect of, you know, my family will never stay at a property on a vacation that's not a Ritz Carlton property. And I'm thinking, wow, that, that must be really nice to be the Hurd family. But nevertheless, um, so he's describing his, his sort of joy and, you know, this feeling of tremendous loyalty that he has to Ritz Carlton because they went above and beyond in this, in this moment of panic, in this moment of great need. Um, and so a lot of my clients started emailing that blog post to me, and usually they would send it to me and say, wow, this is a really powerful story. You know, our CEO is really putting pressure on us to really differentiate the service experience and the client experience, and this really opens our eyes to the possibility of really trying to wow our customers and delight them. Don't just do what our customers want. Let's try to delight them. And so our clients started asking us, what's the best way to go out and delight a customer? You know, we run a large-scale service organization, or we work in a big company. How can we do this kind of thing, create that kind of joshy the draft feeling in, in emotion with our own customers? And so that's what my research team went out to study. What are the best ways to delight customers to drive loyalty upward? Can I tell you a couple things that – really questions that really guided our research. I'm going to lay them out here on the page. The first question we, we tried to get after was, we took a little bit of a step back here, uh, what impact do service interactions actually have on a customer's future loyalty, good, bad, or indifferent? Number two, what are the things that customers can, uh, customer service organizations can do to drive loyalty upward? So this is the Joshi question. What are the things we can do? What are the levers we should pull to delight the customer, to wow them, to blow them away, and then earn their undying loyalty? And then lastly, what are the things that we can do to drive loyalty upward, which also um, uh, keep operating costs in check or, or ideally reduce operating costs? 
um, which is the reality for most people in big companies. You know, we don't have a blank check from our CFOs to go go forth and delight customers. We've always got to keep an eye on the bottom line and our and um, and contain costs as well. Well, I'm going to get into this research, but uh, just so you know, it's all drawn from this book, uh, The Effortless Experience, that we published a few years ago. Uh, if you want more information on anything I talk about today, there is a lot more of it in this book. And we continue to publish on some of this work around creating a, an effortless experience. In fact, there's an article we just published um, uh, in the first quarter in Harvard Business Review called Kick-Ass Customer Service, which really talks about um, the kind of profile of service uh, professional you want to deliver an effortless experience. So I'd encourage you all to check that out. Uh, and if you miss that, uh, shoot me a note on LinkedIn or Twitter and, and I'll get you a link to that article. Okay, I mentioned loyalty a couple of times. Let's define terms, because uh, this is really important as I show you the results of our study. Um, when we define loyalty, we're talking about three things. Uh, not feel-good loyalty, we're talking about repurchase rates, so how likely is a customer to keep buying from you? Um, share of wallet, so how likely is it for a customer to spend more with you over time? And then word of mouth, how likely is it for a customer to say good things about you to friends, to colleagues, et cetera? Uh, this is sort of the net promoter score uh, idea, advocacy out there. When we talk about loyalty, when I show you the results of our study on the next few slides, um, think about our definition of loyalty is anchored on these three questions. It's really financial loyalty. That's what we're talking about here. Okay, um, now the way we studied this, I'm going to skip this slide for a moment, but the way we studied this is that we um, went out to a panel of 125,000 customers who had recent service interactions, and we asked them all about those service interactions. What caused the service interaction? How was it handled? Did you get your problem resolved, uh, et cetera? This was a pan-industry study, covered lots of companies, lots of different types of customers across many different uh, industries and geographies. We also surveyed a lot of customer service reps, so we went to the same customer service reps um, uh, who, uh, whose companies gave up their list of customers who had recent service interactions because we wanted to get the company side of things. How did the customer service reps think that those service interactions um, uh, uh, went down? How successful were they? Um, how um, uh, satisfactory were they from the company's uh, estimation? And then lastly, we talked to a lot of executives at big companies around the world really because we're trying to get our arms around um, what's the conventional wisdom out there? How do people think about um, uh, uh, loyalty and um, and the impact that service interactions have on loyalty. There were three big findings that came out of the study. I'm going to share those with you right now, and then I'm going to tell you across the red, the bulk of today's webinar, what you need to do about them as a leader in your own organization. The first finding is this one, and this was a big head scratcher for us, but it turns out as great as that Joshi the Draft story feels, as, 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 as much as it creates positive emotions for us, it actually doesn't really pay off when it comes to driving loyalty. Let me show you what I mean. Um, most companies think that interaction between uh, loyalty and um, service delivery kind of looks like this. In other words, um, companies believe that nobody generates much loyalty by falling below uh, expectations when you, um, when you deliver a service experience. You probably didn't need me to deliver a webinar to tell you that. But companies also tend to believe, senior executives tend to believe, that you don't get paid back with customer loyalty when you simply deliver the basics. When you just do what the customer expects, that meets expectation level, you don't really earn a lot of goodwill or loyalty from your customers. It's not until you get to the far right there, when you exceed the customer's expectations, that's where loyalty really takes off. You gotta wow the customer, you gotta delight the customer, you gotta surprise them in some compelling and exciting way. That's where you get to that um, high level of loyalty. But when we tested this with data across 125,000 customers, we found that the effect was almost exactly the opposite. Um, that's the blue curve here. This is the actual data. Now, what we found is customers also don't want a subpar service experience. No surprise there. But look how loyal customers are when we simply do what they expect. When we simply meet their expectations, we generate a lot of loyalty. And then the other big surprise is look how the curve flattens out beyond that midpoint. So when we go beyond, when we go above and beyond, when we wow the customer, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to do that, and the customer doesn't pay us back with their loyalty. Now, keep in mind, what my team was trying to study here was not was how you should delight the customer, not whether you should delight the customer. This was a big surprise to us when we shared this with, um, uh, when we found this, uh, this, this finding in the data. It was the first thing that jumped out. We thought it was wrong. We went back to test it multiple times, and it kept coming back the same way. And when I present this to executives, you know, it can be a little bit like the stages of grieving. Sometimes there's anger and there's denial, and we eventually work our way to acceptance. But, you know, the acceptance phase only comes when executives and leaders really think about this from a, um, a strategic and cost um, perspective. Because the reality is 
that delight doesn't happen that often, and when it does, it's really expensive. Look here at the bottom uh, graphic. We found in our study that delightful experiences only happen about 16% of the time, according to customers. And that delight actually increases operating costs 10 to 20%. So if you know you're spending a lot of money to delight your customers, if you're doing things like taking a giraffe around your hotel and posing him in a variety of locations and then sending a whole bunch of free stuff to um, a five-year-old boy, that costs a lot of money. Or in your world, it might simply be giving refunds or doing out-of-warranty service or making exceptions to policies and, and terms and conditions that are there to protect your enterprise's profitability. Um, and when we do that, customers don't pay us back with their loyalty. So it really does beg the question about whether this is the right thing um, uh, hang on one second. Looks like we uh, fell out of the slide presentation mode. I apologize for that, folks. Let me get us back here. All right. Um, okay. It really does call into question whether this is the right thing for us to be doing uh, as an organization is to spend our money and time and energy delighting customers. So what should we be doing? Well, here's where we go from surprising findings to arguably worse findings and kind of depressing findings. It turns out that any service interaction is actually four times more likely to drive disloyalty than to drive loyalty. It's not just that customer service, even delightful customer service, doesn't make customers more loyal. It's that service interactions in general make customers more disloyal. Now, just to be clear, you know, when we have, uh, when our customers have problems with the products and services that we sold them, they approach us in probably not the best state of mind. You know, the thing that we sold them is not working the way that they thought it would work. It's not living up to their expectations, so they reach out to us for help. But what this tells us is not just that we take the customer in a bad state and we kind of get them back to neutral. What the data tells us is that we take them in a bad state and we actually make it worse. What can we be doing to make our customers that disloyal to us during the course of a service interaction? When we break this apart and we look at the data, here's what we're doing. These are the drivers that populate that negative 3.97x disloyalty bar. The things that make our customers this disloyal to us are repeat contacts. So when they have to reach out to us over and over again to get their problem fixed or channel switching, you know, maybe they went to the website to try to find information or fix their problem, and then they picked up the phone. They picked it up not because they wanted to, but because they felt like they had no other choice. Transfers, passing the customer all over the organization um, from one department to the next, asking them to repeat their story over and over again, or simply re retell us their account number after they just keyed it into the, uh, the touchpad of their phone robotic service being treated in a generic way, policies and processes that we throw out there that don't make sense to our customers, but really for the customer feel like simply hoops they have to jump through or hurdles they have to overcome to get the thing that they really want, which is a product or service that does what they expected it to do. And then finally, the hassle effect is sort of a perceptual effect, but how much do customers really think that doing business with our company is frankly just a big, huge pain. Now, when we look at that list of disloyalty drivers, what really jumps out to us, and this is our third finding, is that they have something in common. These are all what we call sources of customer effort. This is the work that we put on our customer's plate to get problems fixed. Problems, mind you, that we created because our product or service that we sold them doesn't work the way the customer expects it to work. They reach out to us for help. They're already in a bad state. And then we run them through this grist mill that you see in that uh, bulleted box um, we put effort on their plate, and we force them to jump through hoops um, to overcome obstacles, and they leave that interaction more disloyal than they were at the beginning of the interaction. That's why service interactions drive disloyalty. And the reality is, you know, when you look at this, for most companies, they would look at this and say, yeah, we know that stuff causes headaches for our customers, and we've been trying to get after those things for a good long time. Most big organizations have. Um, but the reality is that um, it, it's very easy for me to tell you that these things cause disloyalty. You may have already guessed that they would, but the harder question is what you should do about these things. And what we found in the data was a handful of companies who are doing really smart things, who are not doing these things to their customers, but who are delivering, in fact, a low effort service experience. And so we can use the database to isolate those companies. And so we spend a lot of time with those companies really trying to understand the things that they do differently. And I'm gonna share some of those ideas with you across the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Before I do, let me just pause here for a moment because I want everyone to think about um, this as sort of the big takeaway uh, from the book. If you had to hang up the phone now and you didn't listen to anything else I said, um, this is the punchline of the book. While most people think, and most of uh, the conventional wisdom out there, is that you can make customers more loyal by delighting them when they, have their, when they have service issues and they reach out to us for help, what we found is that instead of that strategy, what's a better strategy is for you to focus on making customers less disloyal by making the service interaction a low effort interaction by, oh, looks like we've uh, 
sorry guys, we're having some PowerPoint issues um, here. I'm going to, uh, let me scan over here. I'm going to close this out. All right, there we go. Um, sorry about this, folks. I'm not sure why we're having these PowerPoint issues. Okay, here we go. We're back on the slide. Um, so uh, instead of focusing on delighting customers in the hopes of, um, of making them more loyal, let's focus on driving less disloyalty by making an easier service interaction than we offer our customers right now, by creating a low effort service interaction. So again, don't try to delight customers um, and make them more loyal. Try to make them less disloyal by delivering an easy service interaction uh, to our customers. Um, as I said, that's really easier said than done, and I'm going to walk you through some ideas about how to do that and really focusing on what those low-effort companies do differently. Um, but before I do so, let me share with you a couple of other data points, why we think low-effort really pays off. Now, this is over the next few uh, slides I'm going to share with you. Um, some insights around uh, the business case uh, for delivering an effortless experience, a low effort service experience. The first thing we found is that customers who, um, who have low effort experiences, well, they're actually uh, far more likely to repurchase. 94% of customers who have low effort experiences report back that they'd be inclined to repurchase from the company that delivered that service interaction. Only 4% of customers who had high effort service interactions would say the same thing. Secondly, um, share of wallet. We found that customers who have easy service interactions are much more likely to spend more with companies than customers of high effort interactions. Lastly, we looked at negative word of mouth. So what happens when customers have, um, have low or high effort inter interactions and what does that do in terms of word of mouth? What we found is only 1% of customers over the left hand side who have the low effort service experience, only 1% of them are like, were likely or said anything negative about the company in question. 81% of customers, on the other hand, who had high effort, difficult service interactions, who had to go through those steps and those hoops that I showed you on the last slide, 81% of those customers reported back that they said, they said something negative about the company in question. If we sum it all up, we find that only 9% of customers who have low effort service experiences display any kind of disloyalty, attitude, or behavior towards the company uh, that serves them compared with 96% of customers who had high effort experiences um, reporting some sort of disloyalty attitude or behavior. It's not just though that, that an effortless experience makes loyalty better, it helps you from a loyalty perspective, it's also cheaper to deliver. One of the cool things we could do in our um, data is look at the cost of delivering a high and low effort service experience. What we actually found was fascinating. It turns out a low effort service experience is actually 37% cheaper to deliver than a high effort service experience. So it's not just, a, uh, a service experience that the customers want, it's also better for your bottom line. You might wonder why. Um, and the reality is there's a lot of hard work that goes into creating an easy service interaction, but think about it for a moment. A low effort interaction is one in which customers don't have to call back over and over again. It's one in which we don't transfer them all over creation, all over our company. It's one in which the customer goes to the website and then doesn't bail out and then go uh, pick up the phone and call, but they can stay in the website and get self-service or self-serve around their problem. So they don't have to take those extra steps. And so it really does stand to reason that it would be cheaper for us to deliver a low effort experience. In fact, that's what we found in the data. But you know, as I said, it's very easy for me to point out that these things are loyalty killers or disloyalty drivers, but the reality is really that we need to know what to do about them. What are the low effort companies doing that's different uh, from what high effort companies do? And what can we learn from those uh, practices and those experiences? So let's get into the tactical detail here. I'm gonna share with you three ideas that we found in our journey of isolating with data who those low effort companies are and then going out and visiting them and doing a lot of interviews with their leaders and with frontline folks and really trying to understand how, what makes them tick and how they think about things differently. And what I'm gonna share with you today are three practices, three things that low effort companies do that most companies don't do. The first one we call channel stickiness. Now, let me ask you a bit of a rhetorical question here. Um, how many folks on the phone, think about it yourself for a moment, I traveled in the last, um, they call it 60 days, either for business or for, for pleasure. Now think about that for a moment. When you went uh, to check into your flight, did you use something like what you see on the left-hand side or some self-service equivalent? Maybe you went to the airline's website or you used the mobile app or you, uh, you self-served, in other words, to select your seat, to, you know, um, uh, to um, uh, get your boarding pass, all these kinds of things, or did you use what you see over on the right-hand side? Now, for those of you who don't remember, that is called a ticketing agent. Delta had a tough week a couple of weeks ago, but that's not why I'm showing you this. I'm showing you this not to pick on Delta, um, but to draw the contrast. Now, I can't see the folks on the phone, obviously, but I run this, uh, I do a hands-up exercise when I present this from the main stage at a conference, and I'll tell you, everyone's hand goes up around the self-service side, and very few people say, yeah, I walked up to the actual person uh, behind the counter to check in for my flight. You know, so we've really become accustomed to self-serving 
um, as consumers. And this is really true. But I'll tell you what, the higher you go in organizations, the, the less apt you are to find executives, senior level executives, CXOs in most big companies who really believe that customers want to self-serve. In fact, when you go out to executives and you ask them what they would tell you, and what we tested, we found this in a, uh, a study we ran with senior managers across a wide range of companies, is that senior executives believe that customers have about a two and a half X preference for phone service over web self-service. So what that means is that most executives, very high up in companies, believe that at the end of the day, our customers really want to talk to our people. They want to talk to us. They want to have a relationship with us. And they believe that they overwhelmingly prefer live human interactions over self-service interactions. But when we study this with data, what we find is customers are actually pretty indifferent. They are statistically indifferent when it comes to self-serving or having live service around an issue. And by the way, that holds not just for um, – uh, issue complexity, but also issue urgency. You know, when things are really urgent for the customer, it's one thing to change your address. We all probably do that online or check your balance. But let's say your credit card's been sold or your flight's been canceled. Surely in those situations, you really want to talk to somebody. What we found is, yeah, customers do want to talk to somebody in those moments, but it doesn't look like what you see over on the left-hand side, not even by a long shot. There's a slight preference for live service in those moments, but not like what you see on the left-hand side. We also may uh, think about that maybe this really pertains to younger consumers, those millennials out there, those crazy kids. Uh, it certainly doesn't hold across demographics. We actually found that this holds pretty steadily across age decile. In fact, you, get to, you don't get to the statistical break point until you get to 51 years of age. At 51 years of age, according to our data, uh, beyond that point, customers start to prefer the phone more than they prefer the web. And below 51, they start to prefer uh, – they really do prefer self-service. But here's the interesting thing. You don't get to any consumer – whose preference set looks like what you see on the left-hand side until you get to a customer who's 77 years of age. Now, um, most, uh, for most of us on the phone, I don't know if we're being joined today by, for example, our, our friends at AARP, for you guys, maybe that's the core of your customer base, but for most companies, that's not really the core of your customer base. And the reality is that customers really are accustomed to using self-service. They want to use self-service. They like the control that it offers them. And for us as companies, it's a heck of a lot cheaper to deliver. But, you know, there's a, it's a real conundrum because whenever I show companies this data, they say, yeah, I get it, and I personally like self-service too, but why is our phone still ringing off the hook? In fact, I can tell you the more self-service options we, we offer to our customers, the more our phone rings. Even adjusted for growth in our product set or our customer base, we keep getting calls. We cannot – uh, reduce call volume. Why is that? Well, one of the things we found was that um, it's not that customers don't know you don't have a, that you have a website. It's that they're going to your website and then they're calling you. So what we found specifically is that 60% of inbound service uh, volume for the average company is from customers who are first on your website. They were trying to self-service on the issue, self-serve on the issue to help themselves, but they gave up. And they picked up the phone and called. Now, to be fair, in that 57%, a whole bunch of those customers were just using your website as an expensive phone book. They were only going to find the 800 number. But a huge portion, in fact, the bigger portion of customers actually did go with the intent to try to find some FAQ, some piece of knowledge, some way that they could self-serve around the problem because they don't want to have to call. But they end up calling because the website fails them. Here's a, here's a bummer, too, is that it turns out fully a third of um, – of customers are on the web are on your website at the same time that they're talking to your people. So, if you ever want to um, uh, really uh, get frustrated, listen to your your the calls that your uh, service representatives representatives are having with customers, and you'll hear people say this: "Like, yeah, I know you're telling me I can self serve on that issue. Or when I was on hold, they kept telling me, you know, you can do this online, but you tell me how to do it. I need like a PhD in physics to figure out how to do that. I just gave up and I called." Uh, you hear this all the time when you pick up the phone and you listen in on customer conversations. So what do we do to get our customers, you know, it's not a question of getting them to go to the website, but rather a question of getting them to stay in the website. How do we do that? And the reality is that most companies get this wrong in a dramatic way. And this is really where low effort companies differentiate themselves. Low effort companies know something that most of us, um, maybe deep down we know, but we have forgotten at some point um, in our careers. And what low effort companies know is that choice is not the answer. In fact, what they know is what we actually found in our data. What most companies will do to fix this channel stickiness problem, to get customers to stay in the self-service channel, what most companies will do is they will offer every single bell and whistle possible. They'll offer Facebook messenger-based service. They'll offer video chat. They'll offer callback options. They'll offer an email address. 
all kinds of different options to our customers. But what low effort companies realize is that the more choice you give customers, the, the less likely they are to choose one of those options, the more that choice set overwhelms them. In fact, in our own data, we found that only 16% of customers actually value channel choice over ease. What that means specifically is that 16% of customers out there would tell you, even though um, you are telling me that the channel I am about to pick is the more difficult channel to solve this issue in, I am still going to pick it because I am wedded to the channel. I really like it. Now, to be fair to the data, those 16% of customers tend to be older consumers who really prefer the phone. Um, now, 84% of customers you see on the right-hand side. 84% of customers value ease over choice. What that means is that cu these customers will go with whatever option you tell them is the easiest option. So we see many companies, in fact, a number of companies we profile in the book, MasterCard's a great example of this, in their merchant services division, um, the first thing a merchant sees when they go to the, uh, the MasterCard website is sort of a, um, a, a, a front page or a, um, a first home page that asks them, you know, where, which issue do you have? And what it does immediately is it either directs them to an FAQ or in some cases says, here's a phone number to call if you have that issue. That is the easiest way to solve the problem. And what they find is that their customers really like that kind of guidance. They don't need lots of choice. In fact, when they have lots of choice, they just get frustrated and they make no choice. And in customer service, no choice means picking up the phone and calling because you know that you'll get an answer by picking up the phone and calling. It may be cumbersome. You may be on hold for a while. You may talk to a robot on the other end of the phone, but you're going to be able to get your problem fixed. 84% of customers, though, are perfectly willing to self-serve, but you've got to give them some guidance. Now, here's what I tell everyone to go do, and here's what low-effort companies would, would tell you to do um, themselves. You've got to go out there and you've got to think about what are the issues that our customers reach out to us about and think about all the different options you offer to get in touch with your company. So maybe there's live service. Maybe you have retail stores. Maybe you have field service. Maybe you have uh, an email address. Maybe you have FAQs on a website. Maybe you have a knowledge base. Maybe you have an expert community. Maybe you offer social service through Twitter or Facebook. All the different options. Then array each of those or score each of those channels by how good it is at addressing each one of your common, the common customer issues that your customers reach out for help on. What you're going to find is that each of those channels is not equally good at solving every one of those problems. And then once you figure that out, you've got to ask yourself, are we telling our customers that? Are we telling them if you've got issue A, then you really should call us. But if you've got issue B, here's a, an FAQ in the FAQ section or a a simple place online you could submit a form and get really fast and very easy service. Are we making that uh, that effort matrix, if you will, explicit to our customers. You really need to give them that guidance. But the key to channel stickiness, and low effort companies would tell you, is that it's all about guidance and simplicity and not overwhelming the customer with too much choice. Give them a couple choices, but guide them to the right answer. Don't leave it up to them because they'll make a bad choice. And the bad choice, in often cases, the bad choice for us because it drives up costs is picking up the phone and calling. Now, that's hard work. I admit that. But let me show you um, some easy things you could do right away. And this kind of reminds me of the old Twain quote. I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one and said, this is something that every single co uh, company on the phone today, every executive listening to this should go and do immediately after this call. And um, it comes down to really just writing in a more simple fashion when it comes to our web content. Now, um, there was a guy named Robert Gunning back in the 50s who created something called the Gunning Fog Index Score. It's a way, it's an algorithm that scores the complexity of language. I'm going to show you a URL here in a moment, but let me show you how it works. Um, here we're going to compare two um, quotes from Tim Geithner, former U.S. Treasury Secretary. You see one over on the left. I won't read it to you. Um, it is very confusing and it's very full of jargon. Um, when we put that in the Gunning Fog uh, Readability Calculator, it has a score of 24.6. Now, what that means is that you need 24.6 years of formal education to understand what he is saying on the left-hand side. Now, what Tim Geithner could have said with slightly more, uh, less complex language is over on the right. Much more simple phrasing, no jargon, but it says the same thing as the left-hand side. It just says it in a more intuitive way. This has a Gunning score of 8.5. And there you see the URL at the bottom if you want to go uh, test this on your own. What we have found and what low-effort companies will tell you, a great example is Travelocity, which we uh, profile in our book, 
that one of the most impactful things you can do to dial up web stickiness, to get your customers to stay in that cheaper self-service channel, which is, by the way, the channel they want to be in anyway, the way you get them to stay is you got to write to a very simple level. It's not to suggest our customers aren't smart people. They're very smart people, but they are also attention-deprived people, and they're not going to spend a lot of time waiting through company jargon. So everyone on the phone, immediately after this call, go to your website and start dropping in your FAQs or put into place some, some marketing content or maybe uh, some product descriptions, things like that. Drop it into the FOG uh, calculator you see at the URL at the bottom. Hit Calculate and find out what level of reading comprehension you're writing to. What Travelocity has told us is they found the optimal point of absorption is 9 to 11. A gunning score between 9 to 11 leads to the highest level of information absorption. So a great to-do, I think, for everyone to really dial up that channel stickiness. Okay. The second thing that low effort companies do is they don't focus on what we call in uh, customer service first call resolution. Instead, they focus on something called next issue avoidance. Let me explain to you, but let me ask you a bit of a rhetorical question maybe first, which is, you know, what's the worst question you think a service representative can ask a customer? I, I did this from the main stage once at an event and somebody shouted out, what are you wearing today? Which I was horrified to hear because that's admittedly a very bad question to ask any customer. I found out after the conference this gentleman worked for J. Crew, So in their industry, it's a great question to ask uh, your customers. But in most of our companies, it will get you fired uh, every day of the week and uh, twice on Sunday. Um, the worst question we, we think that you can ask your, serv your customers in a service interaction is this one. Have I fully resolved your issue today? Now, the reason it's a bad question is twofold. First, it sends your customers a pretty bad message, which is, are we done here? Can I get on to the next call? But the real reason it fails is that the reason companies ask this question is that they can measure their issue resolution rate. Most companies measure this in terms of first contact resolution. How often are we solving the customer's issue in one contact? The problem with this is that the answer to that question really varies pretty dramatically depending on who you ask. When we ask companies how good they are or how good they think they are at first contact resolution, well, companies say, yeah, we're pretty good. We solve customer issues in one attempt about set three quarters of the time, 77% of the time to be exact. But when we ask com customers from those same companies how good they think co these companies are at solving issues in one go round, what those companies say is eh, not so much. The customers say that only 40% of the time did those companies solve their issue in one contact. Now, what could explain the difference between how customers and companies perceive things? Well, what it really has to do, obviously, is that customers define, quote, unquote, issue in a very different way from companies. Now, to really unpack this, we sort of took a step back, and we asked a slightly bigger question, which is, why do customers call us back repeatedly? Why do they call back in the first place? What drives that? And what we found is that callbacks actually fall into two different categories. Over on the left, we find that um, the first category is what we call explicit issue failures. This is simply when the customer calls in about an issue and we don't solve that issue. And now that happens for lots of different reasons. Sometimes it's human error. Sometimes it's that the systems are down. You know, uh, lots of different reasons that we, um, we suffer from explicit issue failures. But this is pretty straightforward. This is just not solving the issue the customer calls us about. But on the right-hand side, we found that a lot of callbacks fall into a category we call implicit issue failures. This is when we do solve the customer's issue, but then they call back for some other reason. In their mind, those reasons are connected. But in our mind, and when we ask that question, have I fully resolved your issue today, or have I, you know, have I delivered you, have I satisfactorily resolved your issue today, you get a response that's kind of, yeah, I guess so, or I suppose so, but it's a little bit of uncertainty. The customer gets off the phone with us, and then oftentimes they call back. Now they call back for lots of different reasons we found. One reason they call back, and I'm going to show you an example of this on the next page, is for some downstream issue. It turns out, yes, you solved this issue, but they hung up the phone and maybe a few hours or a few days or a few weeks later they realized solving that one issue actually caused a new, new issue for me. So now i got to call back. But in the customer's mind, those are related issues. They also call back for emotional issues. I don't want to say your customers have emotional issues. I know some of them probably do, but what I'm saying is they call back because of some experiential disconnect. They just didn't hit it off with the representative in the right way. What that could mean is they don't have a lot of confidence in the way that the representative handled themselves, the, their level of expertise. They felt that the rep was just reading off a script and giving them a canned response. They don't really know their stuff. Maybe the customer just didn't like the answer they got, so they want to call back. Now, here's the thing, is that those different types of callbacks are almost evenly split. But it turns out companies are laser focused on the left-hand side. They're all about eliminating explicit issue failures, getting those uh, issues to a one-and-done standard, um, uh, doing better training, providing better knowledge bases for the representatives, all the better scripting, all these kinds of things. 
it process fixes all this stuff. It's, it's really focused on the left hand side. Most companies have completely overlooked the right hand side. These downstream issues, these emotional issues that actually lead to 46% of all company callbacks. Let me show you an example of what those downstream issues look and feel like, just to really make it real for folks. And then the last pillar I'm going to share with you today is really about those emotional disconnects. It's so important we carved it out as a separate lesson. But let me share with you a quick story about what a downstream issue looks and feels like. Hopefully you can all recognize this. It's a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Um, we have a Dyson in my house. Um, and uh, I had a personal experience that will hopefully really illustrate what I mean by a downstream uh, issue, these related issues. So I broke my vacuum cleaner. I, I was vacuuming our dining room, and I, I accidentally rammed the, um, the Dyson, probably because I was trying to do it too quickly, into the heavy wooden uh, table leg of our dining room table. Um, now, on the side of my Dyson is uh, what's called the dust filter cover. Now, when the dust filter cover breaks, um, it comes off, and it turns out no amount of duct tape will keep it on your vacuum cleaner. You just need to call Dyson and order a new one. Um, and so I had to do that. So I went, I called Dyson up, and I had a fantastic service experience. The first thing the representative did was ask me a couple of questions to diagnose what model of Dyson I owned. Um, and then she took me to the website, the, the, the page on the website that showed the, you know, the exploded diagram of the vacuum cleaner to show all the different components. And within a few seconds, she had diagnosed that I needed a new dust filter cover for my Dyson vacuum cleaner. Now, that's a great example of first contact resolution. She solved the issue I called in about. I broke the dust filter cover. I need a new one. She's going to get me a new one. But here's where it took an interesting turn. She actually said to me, I'm going to actually send you two of those. And I said, well, hold on a second. I only have, there's only one on the vacuum cleaner, and I only broke it once. I know I'm an idiot for breaking it, but there's only one. And what she said is, you know, in our experience, it turns out, that customers who um, order re this repla particular replacement part, when they go to install it, there are these little plastic pins and tabs, and you've got to line them up just right. And if you force it on there too hard, you might break one. And if you break one of them, it won't stay on, and then you're back to using duct tape, and you're probably calling me back to order another one. So in our experience, it's really better to send you two because – that way you can learn through trial and error. If you get it right the first time, then you, there you go. you got a spare for the next time you break your vacuum cleaner knucklehead. And if you get it wrong, well, then you already have a backup, and you don't have to go through the frustrating experience of picking up the phone and calling us for another one. And I said, well, hold on a second. Doesn't that cost you guys a lot of money? And she said, well, actually, it's cheaper for us to just send you two now than to have you call us back again. It turns out a phone call is more expensive than this part I'm going to send you. So – I thought that was pretty fascinating. And what that really told me was a great low effort example of not just solving the issue I called in about, but forward resolving the issue I might call back about. They weren't just solving for first contact resolution. They were solving for next issue avoidance, solving not just the, the current issue, but the potential downstream issue as well, really thinking one step ahead for me as a customer. Now, I'd encourage all of us to go back to our, the home office and sit down with our teams and ask, you know, what are the issues we solve for our customers that they tend to call us back about and why? What are the downstream issues that solving this one issue might cause for our customers? And can we take a little bit of extra time to forward resolve those issues on behalf of our customers? What you're going to find is you will avoid a lot of downstream callbacks and your customers will be a heck of a lot happier as a result. Now, I told you that there are a lot of implicit issue failures that have to do with emotional disconnects. And this is where we're going to land for today's presentation. This final pillar, the last thing we found that low effort companies really do differently is that they engineer the experience. They're really so focused on solving those emotional disconnects or solving for those disconnects. Now, fascinating to us when we dug into the data is that we found that effort really is sort of in the eyes of the customer. Um, when you look at what uh, drives customer effort from the customer's perspective, what you find is that only a third of the effort equation has to do with what customers actually had to do during the service interaction. That two-thirds of it has to do with how the customer feels about the interaction, the perception of the interaction. It's two-thirds feel and only one-third do. Well, what does that mean for us as managers and leaders in, in our own companies? What it means is that words matter a lot. The way that you handle an issue, even if it's a tough, high-effort experience, the way that we handle those issues, the words that our people use can really make the difference in terms of how the customer feels about the experience, whether they feel like it was high effort or whether they feel like it was low effort. Now, one of the things we find low effort companies doing, all of us in the world of customer service and customer experience, we all teach our people to have good soft skills, right? To use the customer's name, to smile through the phone, to thank them for being loyal. I'm not going to tell you to stop doing that stuff. It, I'm sure it makes perfect sense to keep doing those things. It doesn't seem like a bad idea to me. But what I'll tell you is that low effort companies don't just do that. 
What they do is they teach their representatives how to use sophisticated language techniques to engineer the experience, to solve for the feel side of customer effort from the customer's perspective. A number of the language techniques we, um, we found low effort companies teaching their reps to use are really rooted in behavioral economics and human psychology. Let me share with you a few and show you the impact they have on effort reduction. The first one I'm going to show you is a language technique called advocacy. This is about using language when you're solving the customer's problem, when you're engaging with your customer, that really is designed to send the message to your customer that you are an advocate for them. You are a representative not for the company you work for, but for the customer you're talking to. Um, in fact, a great example of this, I'd encourage you all to, to try this. Next time you go to a high-end hotel chain like a, um, uh, a Mandarin Oriental or a, um, uh, a Ritz-Carlton or Four Seasons, Go down and complain about something at the front desk. See if you can find the hotel manager. It works really well with the hotel manager. Complain about that noisy ice machine in the hallway or your rowdy neighbors or how you're too close to the elevator shaft or how the Wi-Fi doesn't work so well or whatever it is. Um, and what you'll often find is that those hotel managers will walk around to your side of the counter. They do that to send a message that they are on your side of solving this issue. Now, they're still not going to copy your room or your minibar charges, but what you'll find is that it really does de-escalate the situation. These companies have learned this, and they specifically teach their people to use language and to use techniques designed to show advocacy. Now, when we test this in an A-B test, in an A-B panel, what we find is that language that demonstrates advocacy reduces customer effort by 77%. Simply using words that show the customer that you are on their side, not on your company's side, decreases effort by 77%. By the way, this is not about apologizing. This is about advocating for the customer, seeing things from their perspective, and trying to do what you can to resolve the issue. Saying, hey, I understand. Let's see what we can do. Um, not, I'm sorry you're having this problem, and certainly not leaning back on company policy and using it as a shield to fend off the customer. Now, the second technique we find that works really well is positive language. This is simply using positive phrasing to actually deliver pretty bad news. Um, the best example I can think of for this is uh, Disney. Disney does this really, really well. Next time you go to a Disney park with your kids, um, ask one of the Disney cast members, one of their park employees, what time the park closes. And what you'll find is that Disney cast members are specifically trained not exactly to answer that question, but they answer in a slightly different way. The park closes at 9 p.m., just to be totally clear. But what the Disney employees won't say is the park closes at 9 p.m. What they will say is the park stays open until 9 p.m., and it opens the next day at 9 a.m. And here's a whole bunch of stuff you can do in between. Go catch a movie down by the pool at the resort. Uh, go, go to downtown Disney. Go out for uh, grab a bite. There's a magic show over by the pool. All these kinds of things. And what they found is that people who get the good news version of that bad news answer, they say better things about their Disney stay. They buy more in the gift shop. They say more things on Facebook and Twitter and, and advocate um, for that experience more. It's a much more positive experience and a po leaves a positive impression for those, uh, for those guests. Um, now, positive language can also impact customer effort in a pretty powerful way. It decreases effort by 73%, another huge impact on effort reduction. Lastly, I'm going to show you uh, a, a technique I'd encourage you all to use with some discretion, or use uh, your own discretion, I should say. Um, this is called anchoring. Now, this is sort of the Jedi mind trick of, um, of uh, uh, experience engineering, and I'll share with you a story of how a company um, does this. Uh, which I think you'll enjoy just to round things out today. Uh, anchoring um, is about strategically sequencing um, the option you want the customer to pick within a range of options designed to make that one option seem better than it really is. Now, you may see this sometimes when you go to an expensive restaurant. Let's say you went to an expensive steak restaurant for dinner. You know, um, the price of a steak dinner has really gone through the roof in recent years. And, you know, you go to a restaurant, you're appalled to see that it costs, you know, let's say, $45, when apologies to the vegetarians on the phone today, $45 for a, a, a filet mignon. And it comes with nothing. You've got to buy all the sides a la carte. It's going to be a really expensive dinner when all is said and done. But what you'll also notice is on the menu, there's a $90 prime rib for two or a filet for two. And what you're thinking is, well, yeah, I'm paying $45 a steak, but I could be buying that $90 steak. The only reason that $90 steak is on the menu was put there by a pricing consultant designed to make you more comfortable with spending $45 for steak, which, by the way, is patently absurd. Now, anchoring is a technique that can be very powerful, but it can be also a little bit risky. As you see here, it has a powerful effort reduction technique. Let me share with you a story. This is a fun one to, to land on, um, uh, no pun intended, because it comes from the airline industry. Um, about a real company we work with that was using anchoring in its interactions with its customers. Now, uh, I don't know if any of you, maybe uh, uh, two weeks ago, um, 
uh, during the uh, all the, south, the bad weather in the southeast and all the flight cancellations. I actually personally had to endure this on our way to a spring break trip. Um, our flight was canceled. Um, but uh, think about this. You know, from an air- airline, that's the crucible of customer service. That is probably the toughest place uh, to be in the customer service business. It's really tough. The airlines really get beat up by their customers. And some of it they do themselves, but some of it is unearned. Uh, and that being a service rep in the airline business is just tough. Now, airline executives will tell you, and people we know an executive who once ran a call center for a major airline, and what he told us was, you know, the worst calls we ever get are flight cancellation-related calls. But the thing about it, it's not that we canceled the flight because customers understand why we canceled flights, because they also don't want to fly into a bad storm. They don't want to fly with a tired pilot. They don't want to fly, or, uh, fly on a plane that's defective or has mechanical issues. So they get it. They understand, flight, they understand flights need to be canceled and rescheduled. What they don't appreciate is the way that we handle the rebooking process. He said, let me give you an example. Let's say you're in New York City, I mean, you're in Washington, D.C., um, uh, where we're based, uh, and you're flying out to um, San Francisco. You get to Dulles Airport at, uh, for your 8 a.m. flight. You get there nice and early, 6.30 for your flight, and you look at a board, and it shows this, and your flight's been canceled. And then you call up uh, the airline to get rebooked, and the airline says, uh, well, yeah, the 8 a.m. flight's canceled, and the next available flight is until uh, 5 p.m. tonight. And you're thinking, gosh, I drove all the way out here to Dulles, 5 p.m. is a pretty long time to wait in Dallas Airport. Why don't you put me on another flight? Because I'm looking at this departure board, and all these other airlines have flights going to San Francisco between now and then. Can't you get me a seat on one of those other flights? I and mean, that's really unacceptable to make me wait till 5 p.m. And that's where most service representatives start to hide behind company policy, because what they'll say is, well, according to the terms and conditions of the ticket you purchased, uh, we are allowed to not refund you and to put you on another one of our flights on our airline as long as we can get you out um, within, let's say, uh, 12 hours, and technically 5 p.m. would be uh, less than 12 hours from now. Um, so, you know, there you go. And customers get very upset when they hear that, as you can imagine, because they get really frustrated and they say, well, isn't the customer always right? And I demand to speak to your supervisor, and they start using foul language, and things really kind of escalate from there. And then a lot of service reps will go from bad to worse. They'll say, well, you know, you can go buy a ticket on one of those other airlines, but we're not going to refund you for the unused portion of our ticket that you bought from us because um, it's still within the guidelines of our policy. We offered you another flight that was within the terms and conditions of our policy. And so things go really downhill from there. What this airline executive told us, he said, you know, some of our most tenured representatives, they never found themselves in shouting matches with customers or being cursed at or um, uh, or for folks, you know, getting really frustrated with how we handle that rebooking process. Their customers call up in a flight cancellation situation, and they get off the phone and be perfectly happy with the way that the service uh, issue was handled. They'd still get put on that 5 p.m. flight, and we could never figure out why it was happening that way until we listened to the calls. And here's what those reps were doing. Those very same reps, while all their colleagues to their left and right were arguing about policy and fine print and terms and conditions with frustrated passengers, what these enterprising tenured representatives have figured out you just have to make the customer seem like the option you're giving them is actually better than it could be. So instead of saying, hey, I'm going to put you on the 5 p.m. tonight, what they would say is, you know, I know there's room on the 8 a.m. flight tomorrow, but I'm sure you want to get your destination today. Let me see if I can't get you, squeeze you onto that flight at 5 p.m. tonight. And so they put the customer on hold. They go out. They have a cup of coffee, maybe smoke a cigarette. They come back, and they say, great news. I got you a seat on the 5 p.m. tonight. Now, how do you think those customers felt getting that news, knowing that it could be a lot worse? Well, they felt thrilled with that. They were overjoyed. Now, what the airline executive said is they felt that that was unethical and they made those reps stop doing it, um, which it arguably is unethical. But I'll tell you, when we told that story at a meeting um, a few months ago, there was somebody from the cable industry who uh, said, you know, that's a great idea. Now you're, of course, thinking, well, you know, if it's not the airlines, it's the cable companies would do that to their customers. But uh, in, in defense of the cable industry and of, of this particular executive, what she told us was, you know, the real the equivalent for our customers is when they have a service outage and we have to roll a truck to their house or to their business to fix their, their, uh, their Internet connection or their cable TV or their phone connection, and we tell them they have to wait around all day for a, a technician. Um, and, you know, that's frustrating to customers because customers have jobs and they have other responsibilities and, and you know, it's tough to call your boss and say, hey, i got to work from home today because i got to meet the cable guy. Um, and so what this uh, company started doing is giving customers a choice. They Now when customers call and say, hey, my, my Internet's out, and you say, well, we've tried a remote diagnostic. It's not working. We've got to roll a truck to your location. What they say is now we can do two things. We can send you uh, we can schedule you for an all for a, a two-hour service window at a time of your choosing. The next available one is not for two days from now, or we can schedule you for an all-day service window and we can get out to your house tomorrow. 
and how do you think those customers feel? And they respond, well, it turns out those customers are perfectly happy to accept the all-day service window, but if that were the only option they were given, they'd be super frustrated by it. And that company has told us, this works really well for us because it's more efficient for us to give an all-day service appointment uh, in terms of rolling trucks out and this kind of thing, and our customers are perfectly happy with that option when they know that the other option is worse. So, again, anchoring, use it at your own discretion. Uh, let me wrap up here and just uh, share with you one last concept, um, I think, that many people are familiar with, and this is the idea of the customer effort score. This is a, a metric that we developed as part of this research. We've since revised that metric, and you see the latest incarnation of the customer effort score, the customer effort score 2.0 here on this slide. Um, what you find is that this is a simple kind of transactional metric that uh, companies can use during a, a post-service survey, uh, maybe after a store visit, uh, through any kind of transactional interaction with the customer, and it runs in a similar scale to what you would have in a, any other um, uh, post-transactional survey, asking customers from a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree to respond to the statement, the company made it easy for me to handle my issue. Um, now, um, I mean, let me scroll here. It looks like we might have trouble with this slide coming up. I'm going to scroll back see if we can get it, get it to appear. Um, Hopefully that worked. Um, what we know is that companies that, um, again, going back to the data I shared with you very early on, but customers who come out on the strongly disagree side of the scale or the disagree side of the scale, um, those customers display, display a high level of disloyalty, a lack of intent to repurchase, lack of desire to spend more, a high intent to spread negative word of mouth. And for those of you who are net promoter shops, I know many companies on the phone uh, today are using the net promoter score, a great metric. But what we found is that, you know, look, if service is really driving disloyalty, the equivalent in net promoter language is really about detractors. And what we really want to understand is how do we deliver a service experience that minimizes detractors? And this is a great metric because it ties right into that. What we know is that only 4% of customers who have low effort service interactions also come out as detractors on the net promoter scale compared to 67% of customers who have high effort interactions. So if you're an MPS shop, don't argue that you should replace it with CES, but rather use CES customer effort score to complement the net promoter score and really give you a very precise metric for where you're causing high effort interactions. But one of the things I want to be very careful of uh, suggesting is that this is a silver bullet. It certainly is not. You have to collect a lot of data to really get under the hood of where you're creating effort in your customer's experience and what you can do to improve the situation. Last thing I'm showing you here is just some different ways of getting in touch with us. Um, I already offered to connect with folks from LinkedIn and uh, Twitter. I've already, my, my phone has been vibrating busily here on my desk. Uh, a number of people have sent me invitations and, uh, uh, and, and things of that nature. I'd be happy to connect with you afterward. Let me pause here and just uh, pull up the chat window to see if we have any questions. Um, I know we've run long, as I promised we, we might. Um, let me pull up the chat window and just see if we have any questions or maybe turn over to the for folks from Higher Logic to see if there are any questions we want to finish up with. Uh, we're just a few minutes before the top of the hour, but we probably have time for a question or two. Hey, Matt. Yeah, this is Hunter. I think we, we do have time for at least one question. So uh, one came in. Uh, let's see. So many of your examples are counterintuitive. How often do people you talk with say, oh, yeah, but our customers are different. We know our customers. Is that pretty common? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. You know, I the more likely, uh, Hunter, the more likely uh, – pushback I get is, is not so much like, hey, our customers are different, but more we are different as a company. And, you know, one of the big things we get a lot, and I think one of the big, the hard things for people to get their head around is, um, it's, uh, what we're not saying is that you shouldn't delight your customers in general. You should delight your customers. You should delight them with fantastic products that outperform your competitors' products, with features that they can't get anywhere else, with services that they can buy from you that are second to none. Um, with a really, you know, sexy and powerful brand message. There's lots of stuff you should do to delight your customer, but customer service is not the place to delight your customers. Um, we say that is, that is not the way that delight dollars should be spent because customer service is about making it easy. It's not about making it delightful. And one of the other things, we'll still get some pushback, though, to be honest with you. Some companies will say, yeah, but, boy, we really celebrate those delight moments. We got a wall of fame in our call center with the thank you notes and the tweets and the Facebook messages and all the praise that our customers heap upon our reps. I and mean, they, they'll write a letter to the CEO and to the board of directors praising our folks for, for coming to their aid in a moment of need. And that feels really good. And we celebrate that. And we may, it's part of our culture internally. We are a delight. We want to delight people. We don't want to just shoot for average. We want to do more than that. And what we'll tell people is, look, um, that is, uh, that is a, a very admirable thing to aspire to. But again, 
Um, it's not about not delighting customers. Um, it's about not using customer service as the way to do it. And what you really need to ask yourself, and we have a, a sort of a litmus test in our book about whether you're really a delight brand, because some companies out there really are delight brands. Here we're talking about Nordstrom, Zappos, Disney, Ritz Carlton, Four Seasons, a lot of the high-end hospitality and retail companies um, uh, would fall into that category. But these are companies who have also empowered everyone down to the very front line of their organization to do anything and almost spend any amount of money in the name of delighting the customer and, and, and wowing the customer, because really that's the experience you're selling. What we tell most companies is be careful when you do that, because what happens is if you are not prepared to, um, to spend unlimited amounts of resources and dollars to delight your customers, if you do it once in a while and they don't get it the next time, then they're pretty disappointed because what you've done is you've reset the customer's expectations. You know, my expectation set when I walk into a Ritz Carlton or Four Seasons is very different from my expectations when I walk into a Holiday Inn, and that is by design. They're a very different value proposition. That's okay. But if I walk into that um, Holiday Inn and I get a Ritz Carlton-like experience, well, then I start to expect it every time. When I don't get it the next time, I'm pretty disappointed. So you have to be really careful of that. Um, so, again, the, the, the pushback we get is ten, tends not to be about we know our customers and our customers are different, but more our company is different. We are a delight company. And we tell people you can be a delight company. Just be careful where you do it and spend your delight dollars wisely. Don't spend them in the service channel. And, by the way, the, the, the most delightful thing for your customers is actually an easy service interaction that lets them get back to their lives and lets them get back to what they wanted to do in the first place, which is probably not dealing with the problems that you as a company created for them. Great. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. Again, I want to thank you for taking the time. Thank everybody for joining us. We will be sending out a link to the recording in the next few days. And everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks very much.